Um, what support is there available currently in Coventry for FGM victims? Was that clear? Sorry. Yeah, what support, you, you want to ask about what support there is? Yeah, are there any organisations set in place? Um, that, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, Hazel, do you want to start and then select? Do you want That's a very, very interesting question. Um, the support services for, for, for survivors of FGM um, is quite limited, and I do know that the City Council are working with the NHS here in Coventry to try and improve the services. Um, there are services in, in Birmingham um, that can be accessed, um, but there are lots of organisations, I mean, it depends what you, you mean, do you mean people who have survived FGM or people are at risk of FGM? Both, because I'm from Birmingham and I do know that there's loads of um, support available and because of Coventry, similarly to Birmingham, has a high number of affected communities in Coventry, I just wanted to know if there's similar organisations or support available for victims or those at risk. Okay, well in terms of, of, of the two categories, if, if you feel that somebody is at risk or vulnerable or you just need to talk in confidence, there's the NSPCC helpline, the National FGM helpline that people can access. Um, I don't know if there's one specifically for Coventry, I'll pass it over to Jane in a minute. But in terms of accessing medical help, go to your GP. Um, but there are very good services in Birmingham. And we are developing services here in Coventry, but Jane can probably say more. In London, we have um, the My Centre, which is um, Leila Hussein runs it, and is Dahlia Project, and that is for helping women and girls in psych who had FGM, you know, psychologically. And but, like you said, there is not a lot of clinics that help survivors. We have 21 clinics in the whole of the UK. And this is what we are trying to change. And as we know now, with these difficult times, with financial and everything, some clinics are actually going in London you know, and closing down. So this is something we are working on, and, but there's not a lot of help. But anybody who needs help or just speak to us and can't get access to their GP, just go to Daughters of Eve website and you can follow it up there because there's a lot of numbers and, and help that we offer there as well. Um, hello, my name's Carmel McCalmont and I'm Head of Midwifery at Coventry at University Hospitals. Um, we take FGM really, really seriously in our trust and we've set up a specialist clinic with an obstetrician and midwives, one of whom's in the audience today. And we will refer our women on to wherever the most appropriate place is, so we will refer them on for psychological support. We educate our midwives so that they're very well aware of FGM and how to get the information from the women to enable them to support them. So there are things happening in Coventry and at UHCW we absolutely plan to expand our services. Um, I've just been tweeting a lot and Leila Hussein's just retweeted about the conference and others so it's really really good that we've got the profile there. Um, in Coventry, they also have Celeste and Celeste, and there is um, Care for Women that is led by Sarata as well in Birmingham that is working with us also in, um, in Coventry. Um, and we also have about two other organizations that are looking to work in partnership here in Coventry. Birmingham is opening another specialist unit for FGM sufferers. And the bottom line is when you look at the uh, complexity of uh, FGM, most families travel in between Birmingham and Coventry. So I think there'll be a time when there won't be that boundary between uh, Birmingham and Coventry because most people will feel better in Birmingham from Coventry simply because they don't want anyone to identify them there. And that's what's happening. I believe as well West Midland Police, they don't jump immediately to prosecution and they have a good team who can signpost any victims to a good service. Isn't that true? Gillian just said thumbs up. Um, I think we recognize um, that there's more to do and actually um, the proposals that have come out of the work over the last year since the council motion, um, which was, and particularly what we are 
strongly taking as the sort of stance is that we work with communities. And so what we are doing is developing proposals for how we work with a range of communities. And, and as a number of the speakers have said, female genital mutilation and the issues are different in different communities. Um, and we've, we are very strongly um, determined that we work with communities to make sure that actually it's n this is not just seen as something that is coming as a sort of professional stance, but is one which is actually built in to um, engaging with communities on these issues. So can I ask the, um, any, the next question? I know there was one. Put, can you put your hands up again? Next. Hi, can I just ask um, why the social media hasn't been involved to make people more aware of FGM? You're asking if it hasn't been involved? Yeah. Things like um, the TV adverts, like the AIDS adverts in the 80s. Actually, it has. Uh, three or four years ago when we started this campaign, nobody heard of it. Uh, over the last three years, there has been a high-profile TV uh, programs on it. And we, the British Arab Federation, run a, a social media campaign. We believe we got to about 100,000 people in the UK and Europe. And the response has been fantastic. It's... If it didn't get to you, then it's, it's a shortcoming, which we'll try to even do more. But it's up to all of us to put it on social media, not just an individual. Social media is a democratic tool, which we all call, which we, all of us can use equally, I think. I was just thinking of television adverts, like the AIDS advert. It was on every interval on telly, whereas the, the FGM doesn't appear to be. It may be in a programme as such, but not as, as an advert, you know, that flashes up. Um, I think uh, what we're missing out is that most of the FGM campaign has been led by activists um, and voluntary organisations. It takes a lot of money to put out something like that. I think it's something that maybe the lady down here can think about. But for organisations like ourselves, we clearly can't afford to do. We will, we will love to, but we clearly can't. And most of the organizations, uh, third uh, sector organizations, they have Twitter accounts, they have Facebook. And if you look at them, that's where we communicate and that's where we share information. Anything that changes with the law, we share that. So you can just access those. Yes, you're right. There's no, um, there's no advertisement going on on TV. There is um, posters, and actually it's a pilot for two weeks in London now that is appearing on the trains and buses and stuff like that. But yeah, you're right. One is the money. And, and second, remember, a lot of people still believe FGM is, cultural, is a cultural sensitivity. So a lot of media directors are not willing to put that yet on TV but we are working on it. As you all know, we did the Cruel Cut who came out in November last year. And if you haven't seen it, it was on Channel 4, please go and see it because you see how we are trying to change the law. And last year we were actually invited because we had a part in, um, we, we, had a, we have to gather signatures, 100,000, and then debate on the House of Parliament. So things are changing, but it's changing really, really slowly. But I will advise anybody who haven't seen the cruel cut, please to go and see. And I just want to add one more uh, to reply to the gentleman that was just talking. I just, what I wanted to say is, girls are cut for their future husbands. So even though the man in the family is not there to stop it, they know it's happening. Because the belief is that girl is not going to get married if she's not being cut. So if you see the cruel cut, you will see how we are educating the boys from the Somali community. But what I would like you to do is listen the questions before we sh Layla shows them what, what actually happens to women. And they're all for FGM. They want their girls and women, their future wives, to be cut. So what we need is a man to come out and say we don't want our women to be cut. There is no blaming, but it's been done for the future husbands. So they need to come out and say we don't want our women to be cut. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you.
OK. Um, if we can take the question from the lady in, in the middle last time. No? <laughs> Right. Um, obviously said that the, um, the prosecution rate is um, really low. Um, you also said that there was something to do with border control and um, how they're actually um, questioning people. I wanted to know if there was anything that we could take from um, what they do in order as professionals to be able to, to help enhance our roles and also um, to increase the prosecution rate, how are we actually going about making that happen? I understand that education is really key, um, but how we, what has been done to actually increase prosecution rates? I think we're, we're asking, uh, this panel is going to keep increasing as well. <laughs> Our bottom's too big to fit into that small space. <laughs> Uh, I knew this would happen. Um, basically, um, lack of prosecutions is around a lack of referrals. Um, so the things that we've talked about this morning around raising awareness, as you say, professionals need to know what FGM is. Professionals need to know what to do when they identify uh, a case of FGM. Uh, it should be treated as the same as any other type of child abuse uh, and referred through the same processes. Um, it is about... Um, cultural sensitivities. So having the confidence, because with FGM, a lot of the time, the circumstances are very circumstantial. Um, so it's about having that confidence to ask the questions, ask further questions and refer if you're not happy for us to investigate. Um, so really, the, the question around prosecutions is we, our, our reporting levels are very, very low, which is really one of the reasons why it's not been picked up as an issue, really, um, before the last 18 months because it isn't, we, we haven't had the reports, so therefore it's not a problem, is it? Unfortunately, um, we're realising that it is a hidden crime uh, and more effort and time is being um, put into it. And believe me, there's nobody that wants a prosecution more than I do. Um, and I will do everything I can, um, predominantly around cutters, um, which we do believe operate within the West Midlands. Um, we, we need that information from yourself, so we need you to share information with us, even if it's not specific. We need that intelligence, and we need your referrals to be able to take that forward. Does that answer the question? Yes. Uh, around Border Force as well, um, I work closely with Border Force, and I'm also involved with Operation Limelight, which you might have uh, heard about, which is an operation which we do within the airports uh, on a national basis, targeting flights going out of the country and coming into the country, speaking to families uh, around FGM. Um, so that is something we are involved with in the West Midlands as well on a multi-agency basis. Thank you. In addition to that, uh, we believe, the British Arab Federation believe that the act is, is difficult to, to prosecute. Uh, it's, it's so easy to, to prosecute somebody who's been uh, violent to animals, but it's more difficult to prosecute in, uh, in FGM cases. Statistically, we have failed to prosecute since 1985, and there is only one conclusion, that the act itself needs revisiting. I know Gillian is too professional to criticize uh, a government act, but uh, we can. The, the issue of taking evidence from children uh, needs to be revisited. The issue of prosecuting uh, whether the act, the, the FGM is carried against uh, a British or not needs to be revisited. And the issue of advocacy in the act needs to be revisited. I, you know, there is only one conclusion. If the act is not working, then it needs another look. Uh, we prosecuted here in Coventry, and rightly so, uh, a person who put a cat in uh, a dustbin, but we failed to prosecute a person who cut a girl. It's, it, it leaves a lot of questions that need to be answered on the Act. I think the Act needs revisiting. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, we, we, as professionals, we need to work with the communities, as has been said. You know, I'm involved with, with working within the community. But we can't do this on our own. None of us can. 
Um, the change has got to happen from within the community and prevention is far better than any prosecution. Prosecution is important, but stopping this happening in the first place is, is far better. So we all need to be alert, making those referrals, working within the community to empower people, to empower girls and women to speak up against the practice, to understand the health implications, um, to understand the fact that a man's sexual life, for example, uh, as well as a woman's sexual life, will be... Um, Will, will be not as it should be um, as a result of having FGM. Um, this, so it's an education thing. Um, in respect of the law, there is the serious crime bill going through um, the par Parliament at the moment, which is making changes to the law against FGM. But to be honest with you, um, I don't think, even with the law changed, we would have had very many more prosecutions um, until this point, even with the new changes in the law, because it is around, in my opinion, awareness and professionals having the confidence to report when they believe a child is at risk. Okay. Thank you, Kua. The um, <coughs> next question, I've got one over there and one at the back there and one there. So if we can, yes, that one first and then. Um, I'm very uh, grateful to Virginia for um, highlighting that the questions that we ask uh, women are, are totally inappropriate. Have you undergone FG? Um, um, have you been cut? Uh, recognise that now. And so, can we have some help, please, with understanding what kinds of questions that we can ask? Oh, oh definitely, 110%. If you can leave your details for me, I'll definitely come out. Because the bottom line is, it's not just about the fact that when a woman is coming from the community that's practising or she's had FGM, she is going to cut the daughter, but it's one of the implications, isn't it? It's one of the signs that she has to send the, the bells ringing. However, the approach that we are going to take as professionals, the way we're going to word our questions, the way we're going to approach this woman, the first word that comes out of your mouth, it will really predict the outcome. So yeah, 100%. Um, once we professionals know about FGM, it is really easy to ask questions. Now, when I go to see the doctor, and it's not every day I see my doctor or somebody who knows about FGM in a medical field, they feel, they, they feel hesitant or they don't ask the question. Trust me, when I come to you, I need your help. If I'm ill, I'm in the hospital, I need to get better. So whatever question you ask me, it's not going to offend me in any way. Now, I work in a sexual health clinic, and we ask some personal, personal questions. Now, the, we started collecting our data and, re and recording for the patients that we see, and we just added on four questions into our performer uh, history taking. And that is just simple. Have you had FGM? What type of FGM? And then you take it from there. Because as a professional, you will have questions already you'll be asking, for, asking that patient. So it's easy. Please don't feel hesitant. Nobody's going to feel, I am not going to feel offended if you ask me that. I think I'm, I'm thinking about the issue from the perspective of um, a social worker investigating potential children that are being abused and how we talk to their parents um, in a way to understand whether those children are at risk of... FGM, and that's the perspective I'm, I'm looking at, really. So if there's any help, Virginia, uh, and everybody else, um, that would be great for Lucille. Yeah. I, I totally understand where you're getting from. It, it's simply because even health professionals and the woman herself might not know what type of FGM has happened to her. It might have happened earlier. She might not even be aware that it has happened. I'm happy to work with you on that because our, in our community, we've had a little survey talking to women about the type of, the type of questions and I'm really happy to work with you when yeah. it comes to that. Thank you. Can I just make a comment as well really quickly? Um, going back to the social media um, issue. Why don't we all write to the producers of EastEnders to see if they'll put a storyline in?
Um, hi, first I want to thank Virginia and Huda for sharing their experiences. Actually, um, I just wanted to know, are there any curriculums or training or sensitization modules developed for those, for the communities, for the police who are some or the other involved in it, or for some legal groups who will be part of, you know, this, this whole process if some, some cases or something happens. Because you see, this, as Virginia said, that if the cultural sensitivity, the cultural things are picked up, relevant uh, factors are picked up, and then they're part of the curriculum or the training modules, or the sensitization uh, material, I think that will really hit on all those areas where you people want to, you know, kind of sensitize those groups. The police who are not aware of the cultural problems and all stuff, if they're sensitized, they will be the one, you know, to kind of get involved with all this issue of, uh, so I just, I mean, wanted to know if something. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start because actually one of the major elements that we want to take forward is about developing appropriate training, uh, education and awareness um, and, and for, for different groups, schools, health professionals and, and that's again why we want to work with communities to make sure that they are, they are, they reflect the differences that are, that occur in different communities. So I think both uh, um, to add on that, we are working with uh, Gillian um, this process called the Sentinel, and there we exchange a lot about what's going on with FGM, the law, the changes, culture, and the police at the moment, they are coming out to our communities through Celestine Celeste and sitting down with ordinary people, ordinary citizens, and talking about FGM, so it's there. Um, in London, it's really... It's, it's getting better um, because a lot of our survivors are based in London as well and we are campaigners. So we made our business to go around to different organizations and, and tr give them training. Now for me, I concentrate on health and medical students. So we do a lot of one-to-one um, -one or group discussions with medical students. I cover the level three safeguarding training in my hospital, but this is not everywhere. It's not happening everywhere. And this is, again, something we are working on to try to change because it should be compulsory. And right now, it's not compulsory. So, yes, great things are happening in London, but again, it's all of you please to request if there is your staff members, if you did not have the training, there are trainings in place. And you can request that and make sure your colleagues and everybody else had the training as well. Can I just quickly say that the Home Office, who is responsible for FGM in this country, not for doing it, but for, for trying to end it, um, actually have a whole set of professional guidelines which were reviewed and revised in July this year, they're online and there's also some online modules that you can do and those modules, there's some general modules about what is FGM, et cetera, et cetera, but then there are specific modules for people working in schools, social workers, health workers, police officers, et cetera. It's not perfect, uh, it could be better, but it's a start and it's, it's, uh, it's a national resource, so I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. And at Coventry University, the student midwives all have a module on FGM and it's raised really importantly for them because they have to deal with it in the clinical areas. One of the things that I perhaps wondered was whether or not next year for the local safeguarding children's board training at level three, perhaps we should focus one of those sessions on a multi-professional safeguarding training on um, FGM. That might be useful. Actually, the, the Home Office resource, which has been mentioned, has got a, a chapter on schools. And the best place to recognize the potential or whether FGM has taken place is the primary schools, because girls who have had FGM, they do tend to behave differently. They don't sit as frequent or as easily. And I believe that if Coventry is to take a lead on training all primary school teachers to recognize and deal with FGM, they'll do a great deal of good. And I, I hope this is the start for the whole country where we train teachers to recognize the potential and the, the potential for FGM to take place. 
there is a training back on the, on the Home Office Resource Centre. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll probably have to take just a couple more questions so people can get their lunch. I know there's a couple... For those who couldn't hear, it is actually on the tr training for the safeguarding on the website. And actually, uh, over lunch, we'll make sure we get the website details so that people can know where they can ac access it. OK, I think we had a couple of people over here who've been waiting some time to answer questions. Can, can you put your hands up again so I should can find you? There's a Hello, um, my name's Eleanor Clark. I'm a senior lecturer at Coventry University and I'm here in my capacity as an FGM National Clinical Group representative. Um, as a charity group, we are part of the Department of Health's uh, FGM prevention programme. And it's just to say that the government has invested £1.4 billion in tackling and ending FGM. And as our guest speakers have said, a lot of the work is happening down in London. The work that's going on is around safeguarding. So there are specific resources being developed that will be available in February that will be e-learning online for anybody, whether you are a school cleaner, whether you are a school caretaker, whether you are a school teacher, or whether you work in health, social services, whatever capacity, you will be able to undertake a basic e-learning resource which will help you understand not just what FGM is and how to tackle it, but how to communicate with women and their families and the communities around in a sensitive manner which will enable you to raise the questions and support communities and families with their challenge of preventing FGM. The other issue is that not only are there information with regard to safeguarding but the, and training, but the commission services that the government are currently looking to do means there is funding available for communities and groups who wish to take this forward. So if you've got a really good idea or a good way of supporting a community to work to eradicate FGM, you can apply for funding and you will be able to um, address this issue locally. Because although the statistics that were issued uh, from the government last month suggest that half the women are based in London, it recognises that the other half are throughout the rest of the UK. So it is a problem throughout the UK. We've got to get moving, apply for some funding. I always like it when somebody offers a route to get some, get some, some resourcing to the... OK, um, the gentleman there and then the lady over there and I think then we'll have to if everybody I know there's loads of questions what I'm going to suggest after that is that if you really want to ask your question there's going to be time over lunch to talk to people and I'd encourage you to to do so good afternoon uh, I'd just like to ask why there isn't more prevention put in there are a lot of uh, children who must be very worried because of their knowledge of FGM I mean brothers and sisters who are worried about the brother, what might happen to his sister, and the sister, what might happen to her sister or herself. And these children are very reluctant to come to the authorities because they don't want to offend the family and different issues like that. Now, if we can tackle that in some way, shape or form by having a body of people that they could go to in a very confidential manner, I'm sure we'd go a long way in stopping a lot of the uh, atrocities that, that take place against these children. I, I believe they, uh, the, the, the National Society for the Protection of Children have a, a confidential hotline for, the, for this. However, we could do with a lot more, yes. We could encourage children. And again, we go back to schools. The unfortunate thing is the Department of Education is refusing to make uh, FGM a mandatory issue for 
uh, all schools to deal with in, in the uh, Home Office Resource Pack, which we keep going back to. It says it's up to schools and colleges how to deal with FGM. And I think the answer is through schools, primary schools and secondary schools, is to, here in Coventry, I think we're taking the lead, but to do it throughout the country where schools take the lead. It, schools is the place we educate children that if they are touched, if they are abused, if they are smacked, they need to report it. And it's, we've been very successful as a nation at this, in educating children about their rights and what could happen to them. So the answer is schools, confidential helplines, and they, they are available. We need more. That's my view. Yes, um, that is true. Teachers, we need... We are teaching children to tell them if anybody touches them inappropriately, they need to talk to somebody. They need to see, talk to their teacher. And FGM is just one of them. FGM is against human being human. We shouldn't be going through what is happening to these young girls and happened to us. So it is about educating and it's about having the training in place for teachers in order for them to come out and, and educate children. But I must say, five years ago, nobody was talking about FGM. Every door me and Leila and Zainab and Nimco went, we were closed. They were closed. We wasn't welcoming. And look at us today. We have a room full of people who wanted to know about FGM or already know about FGM. So we are going somewhere, but I'm, I believe nothing happens overnight. And so we have to keep on knocking doors and we have to keep on getting the training that we need in order for us to educate children as well. The, the um, final question, please. Um, my name is Valentine Goyo. I work for um, a foundation called Mojatu in Nottingham. First of all, thank you so much for um, the presentations, how that you brought it to life. Um, I've been campaigning against FGM um, since I was in Kenya before coming here. I come from the Maasai community where it's still very prevalent. Um, my question was, how can people get access to, uh, easy access to um, survivors of um, FGM and those affected? Because uh, we just got some funding for training. Because what we do is we produce a community magazine um, in Nottingham and Berkshire. And what we are trying to do is to produce a network of community champions, especially young girls and women, uh, who can be empowered to be able to speak about this. Um, and we just need to have access to that. So I don't know how easy it is to get into those groups to be able to work with them so that they can be able to, so that we can train them on media and how this can be shared with the wider communities. I think well, we are sort of going around in circles because basically we all out and everyone has just seen how difficult it is to get to schools. That's where we need the laws to change. When it comes to survivors, it depends. It's a personal choice and you have to remember consent. You have to remember confidentiality. It's not easy to go to someone and say volunteer. It has to come from within and it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. And most of us have lost friends. We have lost family. As an activist, as yourself, you know how tough it is. And the list of survivors that we've got that are here today and are still talking about FGF, those are the little a number of women that when we talk to our own women, we use as examples to say change has started because the survivors have started change, but we shouldn't put the burden on their shoulders. Let them come forward when they are ready. Um, yes, a lot of people are not willing to talk about this issue. Um, it, it took me years before I even knew it was wrong. And, and I remember the first time I really hit home for me was when I, Leila invited me for a weekend to talk to the young girls that she used to have a workshop for every Saturday. And all I did was just sit there and tell them what happened to me. 
And I remember looking around the room and every girl had tears in her eyes. I didn't know telling my story was that powerful. For me, it's part of my life. FGM was part of my life. Um, so it's hard to get somebody, but for us who came out, who had enough, who don't want this to be carry on, that there is network. There's, we network each other. So just drop us an email. If there's something you are, we, we can come down. We can talk to these girls. And, but don't give up, because there's a lot of people who are not willing to talk about it. Thank you. I think your story got the tears in many eyes here as well. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, I think we need to reach to community organizations and we need to demand. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for a liberal society to demand, but I think we need to take to cross that Rubicon. Most of community organizations, mosques, churches, community radios, uh, groups like we are active in depend on local authority or on government for their funding. We need to make it at, you know, at a minimum uh, requirement for mosques, mosques churches, or uh, school uh, play group that they should talk about it at least once a year. Mosques should talk about it at least two or three times a year. It's not a lot to ask, and that's how we we cross that line and encourage everybody to confront it and talk about it. It's not, it cannot be hidden anymore. We need imams to talk about it. I have been trying to, we develop a sermon for imams and we need all parts of the community, including the local authorities, including government, to demand that mosques, churches talk about it confront it. It's a must. Okay. Um, can I just ask you all to show your appreciation and thanks for all the speakers today. For <laughs>